So if you're wondering what's going on here, you're just going to have to wait for a little bit because tonight's episode, I went to visit some school teachers which is interesting for me, but anyway, I had to talk to some school teachers and believe it or not, I was rather nervous. You probably picked it up in the video, but anyway, I thought it was fun and the teachers loved it and hopefully we can get some bees in some schools. Well, it's good to see all you guys turn up. I actually even got real excited and actually did some printouts, so I thought, well, I'll hand them around. Well, I'll put you guys in charge of handing them around. I was reading over here on the directions of um, what to do. So if you have a question, you have to put your hand up, so, you know. <laughs> to the yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, I thought that was pretty cool. We've got a little bit of footage about bees that we thought might be just a little bit of an intro to show you what, um, what footage we've got and how cool they are in their natural environment, just to get you in the headspace of what's going on with bees. So we're just going to play a little bit of an intro DVD, not DVD, I keep calling them DVDs or CDs and the lad's going, it's not that, it's called content, you poor old fellow. So, <laughs> so I'm a little bit out of the loop. <laughs> anyway, the life of a bee. <laughs> Cool. That's the man over there that's all that talent. <laughs> so you might be wondering why you'd want to have bees in your curriculum or in your school for that matter. Well, uh, interesting things, I'm just going to talk from my point of view, because I've been in agriculture my whole life and haven't been beekeeping my whole life, but I have been for the last while. And it's interesting, you get bees and you start getting interested in how the ladies operate and you get very interested in how the planet operates. Because it's a very interesting, it's a different concept from when you're in agriculture, you're trying to control nature. When you're beekeeping, you're actually got to work with nature, otherwise you're in all sorts of trouble, because that's what the, the ladies know what they're doing. So you actually have to go and work with them to work with nature to make it happen. And I know there's a little bit of like, I don't know, cross consideration between the native bees and our, and our European bees, 
But the thing to remember is they're all sort of feeding on the same kind of format, well, except there is some native bees that are very particular plants that they need. So that's a consideration if you're going to plant trees and stuff in your gardens or at your school, which would be really cool. So I reckon if you, if you can get the students in, interested, you get a conversation going, not just about beekeeping. You get a conversation going about what's happening in the backyard of your house, what's going on in your farm, what's going on in the wider community. And it, so the thing with us humans is, we've been hanging around with bees for a fair while, because if you have a look on that little bit of a handout I gave you, they were playing around with bees way back in Egypt. I mean, that's getting back a ways. They had them in clay pots in Egypt, and, and I think around the Middle East there, all those sort of area, they had them in pots and they were farming them, and they had them on these little shelves in clay pots. So I don't know how they got the honey out of the pots, but I'm guessing they had to smack them, but anyway, I don't know. let's not go there. <laughs> and even before we were farming honeybees, we were out foraging for them. So our, our, I guess the ancestor ancestors, way back in the day, they would actually track the bees backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, until eventually they'd find their tree, or they'd find their cave, or their cliff face, and they'd go and harvest the honey, as you can see, that's a bit of a cave drawing down there at the bottom corner. I think that's blooming back a fair thousand years ago when that was put on a wall. So that's getting into history. So if you, I'm glad as a beekeeper that I don't actually have to climb up the side of a cliff to get hold of some honey because that could get rather complicated. And there was a few blokes that actually got really motivated to put some baskets in some trees and thought they'd get a bit modern so they could put the bee boxes. Well, they weren't boxes, they were just baskets and they hung them all in these trees. And then, of course, they could actually take the basket away and do something with it. But us modern beekeepers, we got a little bit enthusiastic. Mr Langsworth, he got excited because he liked his champagne, by the way. This is a little footnote. He was a, quite an enjoyer of his champagne. And the champagne boxes happened to be around about that size. So he, not to be a wasteful individual, he got organised. He thought, now am I going to get, how am I going to get this happening? So as he got, got himself organised and he made this little box out of his champagne box. He actually used double layers because the boxes weren't that thick, so he got a bit enthusiastic. And then he thought, because if you actually have a look, I don't think we brought that. Did we bring that pot of actual honeycomb? If you see a natural, I don't think we've got a shot of it, but if you see bees in their natural environment, they'll make little sheets of, like they just basically make sheets of honeycomb and they make it all in a perfect gap. And Mr Langsworth thought, well, that's a good idea. Because up until that time, you have to have to pull the nest apart to actually harvest the honey. And it was a little bit, it's probably not really friendly, really, you know, because it wasn't over happy for the ladies. Nowadays, they get to live down, this is be the brood box where they're all living, happily living on their own. And then on the top of that, we'll have a super box, which the honey gets stored in. But he got organized and he made up some frames. These are being used, obviously. I thought I'd bring them along so you can actually see the capped, this is actual capped honey once upon a time. I reckon he was a pretty clever fella. But the interesting thing is, we haven't really changed heck of a lot. <laughs> like most agricultural practices have changed over the last hundred years. We're still fooling around with wooden boxes and frames. Well, they have got a few plastic frames and a couple of foam boxes, which are kind of cool. But really, actually, nothing much has gone forward. It's all pretty blooming practical. And I don't know, but I don't, maybe, maybe if we could train up some new youngsters, they could come up with an easier way to operate. <laughs> that might be good. <laughs> But if you, if you think about it, what do you reckon, like, I don't know, I was watching the news there about the guys in Queensland getting excited, and, and I don't know, how did, how, do your students, like, have a little bit of thought about what's happening tomorrow, and they get themselves a bit freaked out, I don't know, like, you know, with the environment, and it all seems a bit overwhelming, really, doesn't it? Like, the whole thing, how we're going to fix the, help things, or change the planet, and I don't know, not everybody wants to go off to wherever to do something, but they can do something right in your schoolyard and make themselves feel like they're actually part of the solution. Whether it's only a little bit, it's a bit like that old story, you know, when you see the kid and he's going along the seashore and he's throwing the blooming clams back in the water because there's been a big wind and the old bloke comes along and he goes, what are you doing? Like there's a whole beach full of things. You're not going to save all of them. And he says, yeah, but the ones I chuck in are getting saved. That's doing a good thing. And I thought that's kid's logic. So they can see, they, they go into, if you have your school gardens, I don't know if you've all got school gardens, and you're growing a few veggies, and they need to get pollinated for a start, but in amongst that, you can put some flowers in the corner. And then they can actually start thinking about what the planet's doing, and how that bees actually work. 
I mean, what, is, what was it used to be I, back in the day when it was the birds and the bees thing? You know, when I mean, that was a very interesting concept there. That's, that's always connotated into the, you know, growing up talk, which my dad never got around to giving me, but we won't get there. <laughs> Maybe that's why I never grew up. But, <laughs> so, but anyway, that's a very good thing because it's talking about how plants reproduce. And if the plants don't have bees, they're not going to have any seeds. And if they don't have any seeds, they're not going to have any, any offspring, and then we're not going to have any plants. And the really scary part about it is, if they don't pollinate some of the fruits and vegetables that we love to eat, then we're not going to get to eat them either. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not real keen on eating pasta without the kind of cool stuff that goes in it. <laughs> I reckon it'd get a bit boring after a while. <laughs> Have you ever considered why, why do bees make hexagon shapes to store their honey? Can you see that? I don't know how good your eyes are. They make little hexagons, just little hexagons, and they bake their babies and store their honey I can even have a look at that so you have a close look at it. Any clue as to why, why a bee would make a hexagon shape to make its storage device? Strength. Strength is one of them, yes? No spaces between each of them. Absolutely right. No wasted space. Absolutely very clever little critters. They don't want to waste any, any blooming area. And so there's no gaps. Because if you have a look, if you get a heap of circles and you have all those spots in the middle, the little bits that are missing, yep. Yeah. And of course squares are a bit awkward because you hit your head on them when you're getting out. So, so, so the hexagon's the in the middle part. So I reckon that's pretty amazing. And I don't know how they actually came up with that idea, but I, they're pretty fascinating, really. I don't know, like I was saying earlier, if you actually want your kids to have a conversation about more than, I don't know, what's going on in the Nintendo, or not Nintendo, is it Nintendos anymore? What are they now? What are we up to? PS7? No, I don't know. PS something. <laughs> anyway. God bless them, I'm, just, I'm a little bit out of the loop when it comes to all this modern stuff. But if you want them to have a bit of a conversation and actually get out, and, and the interesting thing, when we play, because with the Bush Bee Man show, we get lots of feedback from kids writing in saying how afraid they used to be of bees, or even adults, as a matter of fact, and they say, wow, you know, they were really quite scared, and, and that's, what do you think if I, if I say bees to you, what is your first thought? What are bees going to do? Sting. sting you, exactly right. Your first thought is you're going to get stung. And do you know that if a bee stings you, she's not going back home. So it's not in her best interest. She's not going to want to do it. And if you, the only, normally, the only time you get stung by a bee is if you're working with them, hence why we have a bee suit. <laughs> but that's because they're protecting their home. If you're in the garden and you're, you know, they're just flying around doing their thing, they don't, they're not fussed. They don't want to know about it. They're happily doing what they're doing unless you grab hold of them and squeeze them or tread on them. That's as usually, if you think about it, when you get stung, you've walked on them, haven't you? Generally on the lawn, you're out there, the old, what was it, strawberry clover our nanas used to have, and you'd be scooting across there on your bare feet. Doof, ow! <laughs> that was usually the go. Or what was that other, what's that other crazy flower that we used to have as lawns when we were kids? Lippy, Lippy that's the one. <laughs> yes, that was, doesn't that hurt? But yes, <laughs> but they're not, they're not actually interested in stinging you. So we've got this concept that that's, you know, that that's what they're about. But if you can get the children, or yourselves for that matter, past that concept, <laughs> they are actually really fascinating. And they're, they're actually, and by the way, you ladies might be interested to know they are actually just about all girls, except for a few boys. There's a few boys hanging around in there, but mostly women folk. Probably why they're so neat and tidy. <laughs> And I thought I'd just bring along a bit, few bits and pieces. This is a little bit of honeycomb, which, with honey in it, but that's, I thought I'd bring a slice of honeycomb. So you can see, which is really quite cool, because what I like about it is that not only do they build hexagon shapes to save space, they build a double back to back. So they have a strip through here, and they'll build it either side. So if you have a look there, you can see closely, there's actually a strip in the middle, and they've got cells either side of that. So nothing's wasted when you're a bee. <laughs> and you, any clue as to how much one bee would, might make of honey? Teaspoon. It would hope so, but it's usually about a twelfth of a teaspoon per bee. Well, this is the point. This is why there's lots of them. <laughs> there's, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. There's like 60,000 at least and up to... I don't know, a couple hundred thousand, depends on how they go and what time of the year it is. But 
that's the other point I'd like to say about beekeeping or bees in general is that's another conversation to have is that they all have to work together to make the thing work. We call them a super organism really. Like they're, they're, they're basically all this cluster of girls all figuring out what they're going to do together. And if they don't work together, nobody's going to eat because you know, I think they might suck a little bit of nectar on the way back home when they're out on the flowers, but if they don't work together, nothing's going to happen. They're all going to starve to death eventually. Because the queen bee back home, she can't actually go out and fly and do her own thing anyway, so they've got to bring her food. And did you, I don't know if you saw those little, the little larvae that were growing there. They have to get fed about every, I think it's twice a minute by the, by the nurse bees. Give them a little bit of food every time. Running around trying to keep them fed, which is pretty hectic. Oh, I tell you what, I'm worn out thinking about it when I watch them sometimes. If you were crazy enough to want to get some bees, there's a few ways to go about it. You'll probably, have you ever seen a swarm? You would have seen a swarm once or twice. I bet you that gives you a bit of a fright. Yes, I was, I was listening to this old beekeeper who was telling me this tale. He was, he was a bit of a swarm catcher. So he's, he's on the mission and he gets the phone call and it's like, oh, we've got a big drama. We've got a swarm down here at the markets. And he went, oh man, okay. So he got organised and he gets in his car and he drives down the street and he gets to where the market was and it was kind of like, well, it wasn't like our Riverland market, but it was at the end of the street. And so the police had fenced off the street and the TV cameras were there and everybody was getting excited. And apparently this bloke had had a swarm actually go into his car. <laughs> so, he, so they're in this blooming big cluster in the car and the beekeeper gets there and he goes, oh golly. He happened to have a bee vacuum cleaner, which was kind of cool and sucked them up. And, but you can just drop them into a box, which is what I normally do because I'm not so motivated to get a vacuum cleaner, although we might get one. Anyway, he catches the bees, gets them contained, goes over to the guy that owns the car and says, can I buy your car keys? Gets in the car and whizzes around the block a couple of times with the windows open so the last stragglers disappeared. Took his box of bees and off he went home and he became, he said it was incredible. It was an instant celebrity because he was like rescuing these bees. He's on the news. He says, I don't know, I'm doing this every day. <laughs> like, but anyway, he thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty crazy story, but I get those phone calls too. I get people ringing me up and they'll say, oh, golly gosh. I've got, a box of bee I've got a box of bees in my hedge. And it's like, um, well, I don't know there'll be a box of bees in your hedge. But anyway, normally the next question is, so how big is the cluster that's in your hedge? Oh, no, it's not a cluster. They're just everywhere. <laughs> it's like, well, it's probably not going to be getting it. <laughs> like it. So if you do happen to have a lot of bees on your rosemary bushes, they'll come from somewhere else. <laughs> a swarm is normally a big ball, about bigger than a basketball is good. Like, uh, so, and the thing to remember about swarms is they're not, that bothered about trying to attack you or do anything, actually. They're so busy looking for a new home. And they're all full of honey. So they've, they've filled themselves up with honey and they've gone off and they're trying to look for a house and they've sent out some scout bees and they, so they're looking for a home and they're poking around in different spots. Hopefully they'll go into one of my boxes if I'm really lucky, they'll save me a job. <laughs> but normally that doesn't happen. Normally they'll go into a tree or they'll on a fence or... I had some dear lady with them under a veranda. That was fun, trying to go up into the veranda. So anyway, I got there before they got in the house, which was good. <laughs> Golly gosh. What do you reckon would pique your children's interest? Like if you were to, if you were to have a, like we, we've got some educational stuff going on and we've got some programs running that, that kids can actually see what goes on inside the box. And then they can actually go to the box. Like if, they, if we wanted to have you were brave enough to have a bee box in your school. I don't know what the logistics are. I think the go would be to actually do what you do best, which is teaching, and let someone like me do what's best and come and manage the bees, but actually and make a, I don't know, a, a day when the kids can see what's going on. I've seen some photos in, I think it's Tasmania, which is really cool. There's a whole army of little students about this big in their little bee suits. And the beekeeper's giving them a little tour of the, of the hive and they're checking it all out with their... Oh, that's so cute. I, didn't know, I, haven't, I don't think I've got that photo, but it's absolutely awesome. Getting <laughs> little, little cute little kids. And they're... Who knows? One of them might become a beekeeper. You know? I mean, honestly, who knows where your kids are going to end up? That's the thing. Who, which direction... Do, they can all go in different directions and, and anything's possible in the end, isn't it? We do a... Basically, uh, it's $45 a month to have the beehive hired out. So then we come and look after it and make sure it's all healthy and nice and happy. And, and then, there's a, then we have a bit of an interactive program going on so we can come and talk. So I've got, I think I've, when's that? Next couple of weeks' time. 
come down to Pinaroo to talk to the classroom about that. And just a bit of an interaction time so we can talk to the kids about you know, beekeeping and bees and natch and whatever else they want to talk about. And so I'll take the load off you guys a little bit so you don't have to and do with the whole, all the, carry the whole lag. And um, yeah, so that works pretty good, I reckon. And just keeps the kids organised and gets them thinking about what's going on in the garden, go for a bit of a wander. We have had a few requests about actually establishing a, a place for the kids to come, which would be kind of cool if I could afford that, but that might be <laughs> something down the road. <laughs> I have actually got this crazy idea. Well, I have not a crazy idea. I really would like to have a bee sanctuary park that people could come and look at, you know, how to plant the garden and how to do stuff. But how to finance it is my issue. I don't know. I mean, I've got some land, but <laughs> actually putting, the, putting all the plants and the irrigation and the, and the whole thing together could, yes, it could end when, you know, heck, I don't know, you'd have to build a building to put them in to have the thing. Like, that could get, could get complicated. There's a few people in the hills that do it, like, because, of course, they've got a bit bigger population. Did you know that there's about 100,000 girls in here and they're all making honey? As a matter of fact, they're all off to bed at the minute and they're just saying, thank you very much, it's been a very busy day and I'm just going to go in here and have a little nap. Actually, they don't even have a nap. They go in here and have a little wriggle up and keep each other warm and keep their babies warm, which is pretty intense. And if you would like to know what else is going on with beekeeping and what's happening behind the wall, behind here, it's pretty incredible. And if you'd like your students to know what's going on inside this box, you wouldn't believe the amount of blooming interest I've had from schools about making a blooming educational video about beekeeping. Because there's very much concern out there in the planet, and especially here in Australia, about what's going on. And we're all thinking about the environment and what's happening in the world, and students are asking questions. So we've had requests for making the Bush Bee Man into more educational, more modules, more part of, so it could be part of your curriculum. I think it's curriculum, that's what you do, isn't it? And the other really fun part about being a beekeeper is you get, a bit, you get a bit interested in what the bees like to eat. They really love a bit of lavender, so we plant, we're, well, it's gonna be a hedge here eventually, but anyway. And, but different lavender bushes are seen to be different and attractive. This particular lavender here, the girls seem to really love it. They can get a bit of nectar and a bit of pollen out of it. It gets you interested in what flowers the bees like. So it's another really cool thing about beekeeping is you do a bit of research and not every flower is bee friendly. If you look at there's some bees drinking some syrup, that's their tongue that they stick in. Anyway, they stick that in the nectar part of the flower and they get the nectar and they bring it back to the hive and then they share it amongst themselves until it dehydrates a bit. And then they put it in a cell and then they fan it and then it turns into honey. And it was interesting because they, most people think that the bees actually just bring the honey in off the plant. But the honey is actually created in here. So they're, they're actually only bringing nectar, which is the sweet part of the flower. So what we need from you is some solid support. So when we go to get some funding, when we go and talk to the education department or the state government or hell, the federal government, they got plenty of money, we'll go and talk to them. So as we can actually make some awesome content that you can show your students and heck, you never know what a conversation. You wouldn't believe where you go when you start talking about bees and what else it involves, the environment, the natural world we live in and how important pollinators are. And you know what? If you like to crunching on an apple or nibbling some almonds, you better get some bees. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that. I thought it was pretty interesting. The teachers actually were riveted. They didn't know how quick time could fly when a bloke can talk. But if you'd like a school visit from the Bush Bee Man, contact us on the link below or email me or John or somebody. I'm not really sure. Somebody needs to be emailed. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get in touch with us. And if you're interested in an online training program for your own beekeeping needs or for your kids' needs, in the comments down here somewhere, there's some, apparently there's a button down here somewhere in the comments section. Just let us know if you'd be interested and you want to get involved and back us in our endeavours to share the word about how important bees are.